Well, today we're going to uh, continue in miracles. And so go ahead and bring me the title slide. So we're going to continue in talking about miracles. Last week we talked about the miracle of forgiveness. Today we're going to, it's going to be a, a, a teaching that we're going into. Actually, uh, they gave me more time this morning because of the in-depth part of the teaching that we're going to be doing. I would really suggest that you take notes uh, take notes on your phone, on, on a piece of paper. Don't be looking at, uh, you know, social media or looking at other stuff. Make sure you're focused in on what God wants to do with you and in you today. Amen. I'm just going to warn you straight up. Um, at the end of this message, you're going to kind of be uh, almost numb a little bit. You ever watch the movie and at the end of the movie, you can't really get up just yet? You're kind of going to be in that state, okay? Uh, but it's good. It's going to be a good thing. But we talked about forgiveness. And the miracle of forgiveness is when you get that, that weight of sin lifted off of you, that, that burden of sin, that, that guilt, that condemnation, where it just lifts off of you. We talked about that. Today we're going to go one step further where the miracle of forgiveness also produces something else. It produces a reconciliation with the Heavenly Father. Part of the reason Jesus did what He did on the cross was not just to forgive us of our sins, but was to reconcile us to our Father, to give us all access to the Father. Before that, man didn't have access. You only had one man, the high priest, who can go into the Holy of Holies. After Jesus did what he did on the cross, it reconciled us all back to the way it was in the garden where Father can walk with you in the cool of the day and have this intimate relationship with you. And I tell you what, that's the beauty of Christianity is that it's not a far off God, but it's one that he wants to be close to you. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. He wants to walk with you, talk with you, listen to you. I don't know about you, but that excites me. Can I get an amen? So forgiveness helped bring that about because sin had separated us. And so through the forgiveness of God, we were able to be brought close to God again. And that's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 19. And look, these are the, the fundamentals of Christianity. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creature. I love the fact that we're the 2.0 human being. Come on, someone. We are new creatures. We're not the same as anyone else that's ever been on planet Earth. We are very different because we've been given a new heart. We've been given the Spirit of the Lord in us, not just with us. And so we're a new creature. Old things have passed away. How many know when you get saved, some of them old things got to go away? And behold, new things have come. A lot of times, new things don't come because you don't let go of the old. So if you're in here, you got to let go of the old if you want to experience the new. It says, now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the what? Ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them. Thank God for that. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Thank you very much. The word of reconciliation. So we are called as the 2.0 new human being to carry this word of reconciliation on the inside of us. We have purpose. A lot of Christianity, they only eat the appetizer. They never go to the main meal. The appetizer is when you're in the word. The main meal is when you understand that we have a purpose, and that is to go around and take people who do not know God and to bring them close to God, to reconcile them with God. So we carry this around, the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling others to our Heavenly Father. However, it doesn't stop there. Our Father, in return, asks us to forgive those who have sinned against us and reconcile to them just as he has done with us can i get a amen as a matter of fact his forgiveness is predicated on our ability to forgive others 
You know, when we're saying the Lord's Prayer, what's one of the things you see in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us of our sins as what? As we forgive those who have sinned against us. And if you go to the end of the Lord's Prayer, it actually says, it reemphasizes, out of all the Lord's Prayer, it reemphasizes one part of the prayer. It reemphasizes, it says, if you do not forgive others, neither can your heavenly Father forgive you. So this forgiveness thing is huge. Man, we love talking about it when it was forgiveness to us last week. But now we need to also love talking about giving forgiveness to others, which we are all called to do. And not just to forgive, but to be reconciled with. A lot of people say, well, I forgive them, but I'll never talk to them again in my life. No, no. Now we're going to kind of get in. I'm going to explain some things to you on this. Listen, this is going to go deep if, if you're willing. Is anyone willing? Are your minds willing? Are your hearts willing? All right, so you got to go to the parable of the unforgiving servant, which is found in Matthew uh, 18, 21 through 35. And if you go and you read that, uh, Jesus is talking about something that is mind-blowing, really. And it goes with the Lord's Prayer as well when he says, If you don't forgive others, neither can I forgive you. And he tells this parable, and he says, look, uh, there was this king, and this servant owed him a, a large sum. That sum would be somewhere today around, like, right at $5 million. He owed him, like, $5 million. And the guy came in, and he owed him $5 million. He said, pay up. He said, I can't. And he said, well, take him, take his wife, take his children, and take everything he has, and sell it, and put him in prison. And so the man fell down on his knees and said, please, please, I cannot pay you, but please don't do this. And he said the king felt compassion for him. Remember a broken and a contrite heart? God can't refuse. So the king felt compassion for him and said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to forgive all your debt. You may go. And so the man was very excited. How many of you know if you've just been forgiven of almost $5 million, you'd be excited, right? So the man goes out, and five million back then was a lot more than it is now. The man goes out, and he's excited. He's walking down the street. Wow, wow. I don't have to go tell my wife and kids they're about to be sold. I now can tell them we are debt free. He's walking down the street, and he looks over, and he sees a guy that actually owes him about $8,000 in today's currency, about $8,000. And so he sees this guy that owes him $8,000, and he goes up, he says, hey, I want you to give me the money you owe me. And the guy says, man, I'm sorry. I I just don't have it. I can't. So the guy goes and starts choking him. I said, pay me. And he's choking him. And of course, the guy still don't have the money. Choking me is not going to give you the money. So then he calls and he puts him in jail. Now, here's a guy that had been forgiven of so much, but when someone owed him not even a, a smidget of that amount, look up smidget, you're going to see the amount, <laughs> smidget of that amount, he wants to not forgive him. He wants to hold it, hold the line. I want justice. Yeah, if you would have got justice when you were before the king, but I want justice. Hold the line. And so I guess he, because he thought someone owed him something. See, when we go around thinking people owe us something, we're, in a, we're not in a good mindset. Uh, people owe me something. They, I, you know, no. And so, throws him in jail. The other people see this. They go to the king and say, you'll never guess what happened. We watched you forgive that guy, and he went through that guy in jail. He only owed him $8,000. The king was furious. And he said, go get that guy. So he brought that guy back in. Now, this is going to wreck your theology a little bit, but it, it, I don't think I even fully understand it. But he, he, he brought the guy back in, and he said, what is it you have done? I've forgiven you of all this, and you're going to hold that against them? I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. All that debt I just forgave you of, it's reinstated on you. Then he told him, he said, now take him and bring him to the jail and torture him. So this time, torturing was in. So because he was unwilling to forgive, not only 
was what he was forgiven reinstituted upon him, but then he, it was worse. He was even tortured for it. Wow. It's good to forgive people. Matthew 18, 21 through 22, which is the same context. This is actually where that story came from because they're talking about forgiveness. And Jesus was just talking about reconciling with people and going to them. And if they ask you to forgive them, you need to forgive them. And so Peter's kind of going, all right, but, but how many, right? So then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I still forgive him up to seven times. And so here's Peter like, what? Okay, but how much we got to do this? I, I might could do this a, a few times, but how many times we really got to do this? And so seven times was it, you know, because he read in Proverbs, which he would have read, where it says a righteous man falls seven times but gets back up. Is it there? Actually, I, you know, that could be, but I think it's deeper than that and further than that. Because Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 77 times. Now, I know some translations out there says 70 times seven, but that actually they've, uh, through looking at the manuscripts and everything, found out that's not really accurate. It actually says 77 times. And so 77 times, and most of your updated translations have this correction, 77 times you shall forgive them. Now, Peter and Jesus are not coming up with these numbers out of the air, but from Holy Scripture. Because then, Scripture interprets Scripture. And you go all the way to Genesis, and you see this being played out. I'll tell you it's a teaching today. Genesis 4, 14 through 15. This is talking about uh, Cain. Cain had killed Abel, and God has corrected Cain by pushing Cain out and away from his presence. So behold, Cain is talking to God. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and I will be hidden from your face, and I will be a wanderer and a drifter on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him Seven times as much. And the Lord placed a mark on Cain so that no one finding him would kill him. So here you see the seven come into play. God is saying, okay, I have corrected Cain. If anyone tries to do anything further to him, then it's going to be seven times worse for them. And then you drop down in the same chapter to Cain's great, great, great grandson, Lamech. And so in, in uh, Genesis 4, 23, and Lamech said to his wives, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Oh, I like that, Cindy. Listen to me, you wife of Mark. <laughs> right? How do you like the way they talk to each other? I, I kind of like that. You wife of Mark. Uh, pay attention to my words. Now, this is what he says. He's confessing something to his wife. I have killed a man uh, for wounding me. So this man attacked him and he killed him. And a boy for striking me. Could have been a father and a son attacked him and he actually kills both of them. Now, watch what he says. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. So here you see the same thing that's brought in where Jesus and Peter would have been reading Genesis, knowing it backwards and forwards. And so Peter goes seven times and he goes, no, 77 times. In other words, what God is saying is if someone tries to punish someone beyond what he has punished them, then seven to 77 times worse will come upon them. That's why the Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. You don't repay anyone anything. It belongs to me to do that. When you step in and try to do that, then I'm actually going to heap it on your head. By the way, that's found. Anyone can tell me? Anyone can tell me? Romans what? 
Come on, someone can tell me out there. Where he says, do good to your enemies, Romans 12. And he said, feed them if they're hungry. He fires upon their head. There we go. Okay, I knew y'all knew it, where it was, right? All right, so, and then you look in the scripture, and it says the same measure we use against someone else is measured against us and more. And more. Because then you go to Luke 6, 37 through 38, and in Jesus' teachings here, it says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, which means forgive, and you will be forgiven. Now, we use this scripture that I'm about to read in the, talking about money. But he's actually talking about grace. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now watch this. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So if we judge, then that measurement's coming to us and more. If we hold unforgiveness, then we're going to be reinstated with things that Father has forgiven from us. Basically, we go fish them out of the sea by having unforgiveness in our hearts. We are called and commanded to forgive people. We're called and commanded to forgive people who would say that's a true statement. Then why do we not do that? All right. Colossians 3, 12 through 13 says, So as for those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. So compassion, remember, when God explains who he is to Moses, and that's one of the things he says, I am the God of compassion. So when you have a lack of compassion, you normally lack in a bunch of other areas. It says put on a heart of compassion. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Watch this. Bearing with one another and doing what? Doing what? Hmm. Forgiving each other. I don't know if I can do that. How can I do that? I have people ask me that all the time. How can I forgive them? Well, it's easy. Whoever has a complaint against anyone. This is not my words, by the way. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so must you do also. So that man, just as God had forgiven him of all that he did, likewise, that's what he should have did with the person who owed him. But he didn't do that. See, we should not deal with people according to the way they have done to us, but according to the way God has dealt with us. See, we want to deal with people according to how they've dealt with us. And God says, no, that's not what I'm calling you to do. You deal with people according to the way I have dealt with you. And that's how we can love our enemies. Because God loved us before we ever loved him. By the way, it's the pathway to reconciling people. Before they ever love you, you love them. But we like to stand back and say, I'm not going to love anyone until they love me. No, no, that's not what Father did. And so we love them. And then what it happens, the power of love, the power of goodness, turns their heart around. So that they, in turn, end up loving you. And, and hence changing the whole world by loving even our enemies, by not dealing with each We got to quit dealing with each other according to what someone done me and start dealing with each other according to what God has did for me. And then we will not choke someone, feel entitled, feel like I want justice. Believe me, no one here wants justice for the things we've done. Because justice for the things we've done is death. And Jesus paid for it. 
so that we can be gracious, so we can know mercy and we can give mercy. Freely you have received this grace and mercy. Freely should you dev it out. Amen. Amen. We're called and commanded to reconcile with each other. Can we say that that's true in Scripture? That we're called and commanded to forgive and then reconcile. Not just forgive, but also reconcile. Some of you get nervous already. Because I know names are going through your head right now. And that's good. The Holy Spirit is causing them names to go in your head. In the last days, Paul told Timothy that people, now this is how the world is, that people would be unloving, irreconcilable, and malicious gossips. That's the center of the scripture. It said, in the last days, this is how people will be acting. First of all, they're unloving. Because love, love is always seeking to reconcile and to speak well of. Where when you become unloving, then there is an irreconcilability that someone has. You can't reconcile with them. We need to be a people that are reconcilable. When someone comes to us and says, man, I know I did you wrong, but please forgive me, I'm sorry. Then we need to accept that. We need to accept that. We tend to not accept that because we then will justify our unacceptance or irreconcilability by saying, yeah, but you don't really mean it. How do you know what they mean? Did you create the heavens and the earth? Did you form them in their mother's womb? You barely know. You barely know what you mean. There's no way, you know, you take, when someone tells you, you take it. Well, they didn't do it this way, or they didn't, they put a butt to it, or they didn't, listen to me, you take it, because we are reconcilable people, eager to reconcile. Here, what's happening? When they're unloving, they're irreconcilable, and the way you know that you're falling into this is you start gossiping about those people. You get on social media and you start tearing them up. Right there tells you, you start talking to someone else about someone else. Tells you that you're in an irreconcilable place, that you're not walking out of love, that you're walking from an unloving place. You're walking exactly the way the world walks. I'm sorry, guys. This is just a word. If you want something else, you got to go somewhere else. Amen. Because this is the word. And when it, when, it, when, it, when it challenges, and this is not meant for condemnation, this is not meant for guilt, this is meant to guide us in the way of the light, to guide us in the truth. Because when we're in an irreconcilable state, we're only harming ourselves. To hold bitterness and, and unforgiveness towards someone, is, is, it's like... Eating rat poison and expecting the other person to die. It's just plain stupid. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say that word. I'm sorry, it's in my translation. So, New American Standard 20 has that word. I'm sorry if I... I'm sorry if I offended you. And the Bible says you need to reconcile with me. You need to forgive me for that. Okay? I do really mean it. I know some people are more sensitive than others. Examples in the Bible of reconciling people. First one, Jacob and Esau. Uh, Why did Jacob need to be reconciled to Esau? Can anyone tell me? Raise their hand. What did he do to him? Michael? Oh, he tricked him, didn't he? He tricked him to sell his inheritance for a bowl of soup. Soup! I mean, goodness, it could have been like a a steak or something. Soup! So he sold his inheritance for a bowl of soup and basically then tricked his dad, right, Isaac, 
and giving him the blessing that was supposed to go to Esau. And so after doing this, Jacob actually means, what, does anyone know what that name means? De- deceiver, trickster, right? Trickster, deceiver. Uh, what's that, uh, Kevin Dale, what's the, well, he's probably in the back. Loki, this is the Loki of the Bible right here, right? So the trickster, the deceiver. And so because he did that, he was afraid of Esau because he said, man, when Isaac dies, Esau going to kill me. So he left. And he left to get away from Esau. He didn't leave because, oh, uh, here's a famous one. I feel God calling me to a different season. And you know good and well you're not leaving because of that. You're leaving because you got, either you did something or you got a fence in your life. And you want to get away from the person. That's why. And so you leave. And so he left. And he ends up uh, getting tricked himself. And he stays gone for a long time. I think it was like 20 years, Pastor Joey. 20 years he stayed gone. And so then he's got, man, he's, God's blessed him. You know what's crazy? Just because God's blessing you don't mean you're in the right place you need to be. As a matter of fact, let me say this. I'll say this. Sometimes when you're doing wrong, you'll find the blessings of God come on you more. And people get confused where that means God don't care about it. No. Because he's so good, he says, I want my goodness to turn you. It's the goodness of God, it says, that leads us to repentance. So when you're, you're doing wrong and you're seeing good, that's God's mercy going, man, I'm trying to pour this on you so you'll see me. And you'll turn from that. But so uh, I, I probably need to hurry up a little bit more. So, so, uh, so Jacob, 20 years, he's been blessed immensely. He's going into the promises of what his father blessed him and gave to him. But he's got to run slap dab into Esau. Here he is going with everything he's got, his wives, his children, his, all, the, all the servants, the, all the animals. I mean, he's very wealthy at this point. And all of a sudden he hears Esau's coming. And in his mind, Esau going to kill him. Esau going to gut him and string him up. And so, man... Jacob does not want to face Esau. So he starts sending gifts. And then he starts breaking up his camp. And he puts certain wives in the front and certain wives in the back. What is that saying? (laughs) Kill them first because I like them better. I'm serious. I'm just reading the scripture. So (laughs) that's why God says it ain't good to have multiple wives. Look, in Africa, they, they have multiple wives. And Pastor Mendici says, every one of the guys that have multiple wives has stood up in church and said, you don't want multiple wives. <laughs> it's not twice as good. It's twice as bad. <laughs> you don't want multiple wives. Right? So, but let, let's keep going. So, so Jacob does not want to face Esau. He does not. But God says, before I can bring you to your real promises, you've got to face this broken relationship. You, you've got to reconcile to your brother. You've got to reconcile to him. Jacob then wakes up at night and says, ah, I can't do it, and tries to run, goes across the river. He's running, leaving everybody, runs into an angel. The angel grabs him, they wrestle, and, and God ends up pulling his hip out, so he can't run. So now, he can't only can't run, he can't fight too good either. Oh, did I, did I just hear what I said? Not only can he can't run, he can't fight too good no more neither. And so God says, no, you can't run. You're going to face him. There are some people in our life that God's going to bring you back to. And you better not run from it. You might end up with a limp. You want to face them. And here's the beautiful part. Jacob's all worried he sees Esau and said, oh, goodness, I'm about to die. I'm about to die. It ain't going to go well. You know how we self-talk? We don't self-medicate. We self-destruct, right? And so he goes. He sees Esau. I want you to watch this. He bows down. Can someone tell me how many times? Seven times. Seven times, Lord? He bows down seven times, thinking, okay, 
Esau runs up and grabs him and hugs him and, and just loves him and says, I miss you so much. You see, what we don't understand is when God is leading us to reconcile, that he's not just leading us, he's dealing with the other person too. And if we would just listen, and we got in our mind how it's going to happen, then it don't happen that way. Now, let me give you a, a, a lesson here. So not only did they reconcile, but Esau at this point is like, man, why don't you just come, come back home, be with me, let's hang out. Jacob goes, no, you know, I think I'm good. And so he went the other way. Esau goes this way. So reconciliation does not always mean that you're going to live together the rest of your life again. I'm talking about with individuals that, are, that are, have been broken. And sometimes you reconcile and then you can go your separate ways, but now there's no bitterness. Now there's no talking about them. Now you're glad when you come across them. Come on. Hey, what's going on? There's no weirdness. Who hates that weirdness? In the store. Oh, there's so-and-so. Um, mm. I'll look at him right here. Well, I'm just shopping. And you look down. Oh, depends. Mm. Say. <laughs> she just went and hugged him. Amen. So. Paul and Peter. Paul and Peter, another example of this. By the way, <laughs> Paul had a lot of reconciling to do. Look, this is the guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Hen and Barnabas. Bam, bam, bam. You know, here, Peter. He, he addressed Peter, and him and Peter were kind of going at it. We eventually, they say, you know what? Let's do this. Let's give the right, each other the right hand of fellowship. Instead of letting this turn into something bitter, something bad, let us just realize that, man, maybe I'm supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that, but let's not do it mad. Let's shake each other's hand, and that's where the right hand of fellowship comes from. Man, I, wish, I really wish you the best, and may God bless you. And, and, and that's how, if we ever depart, it should never be in bitterness. Can I get an amen? Joseph and his brothers. I mean, my goodness, Joseph was done a little bit wrong. Who can say he was done wrong? I mean, he's got the coat of many colors. He's serving. The brothers didn't like him. They were jealous of him. They ended up throwing him in a pit, selling him as a slave. He ends up, while he's a slave for Potiphar, the wife lies on him. He's in jail. I mean, you're talking about 22 years that this is going on. You had, of course, that was about 15 years. And then you had the seven years of uh, plenty, or 13 years. Then you had the seven years of plenty. Then you had the two years of famine before something happens. So he was, how do you know? Who can say Joseph was done really wrong? Bad wrong, right? Right? But 22 years later, there pops up his brothers. Now, Joseph, when his brothers popped up, he could have been, oh, triggers. I got triggers in me. It's pulling off triggers. I'm feeling like I'm in a, I'm in a pit. I'm feeling like uh, I'm in slavery. These triggers are messing me up. These triggers are causing trauma. Oh, the trauma's coming back. I don't know if I can function anymore. Joseph didn't allow his trauma to trigger fear, hate. He allows his trauma to trigger compassion. See, in the world, I'm sorry, he was triggered with compassion. Oh, maybe, maybe it's because Joseph remembers when Esau met his dad because Joseph was next to him and Joseph watched this play out and he knew his dad had deceived him had, had stole his birthright and everything else and he's watching and he watches Jacob bow seven times and he sees Esau hug him and forgive him because Esau wasn't just going to kill Joseph is, or, or Jacob and he's going to kill Joseph and everyone else too so maybe he learned a lesson of reconciliation by watching his parents and his uncle. What do our kids learn from us about reconciliation? 
that's going to prepare them when they're going to be done wrong in life. Because I promise you, you will be done wrong. No one gets out of this world without being done wrong. As a matter of fact, you can't even walk in the feet, the shoes of Jesus until you've been betrayed. So Joseph is triggered by compassion. When he sees his brothers, he's like, uh, no, he actually had to walk in another room and weep. He had to weep. He forgave his brothers. He brought his father in. And years go by, his father dies. When his father dies, his brothers are still thinking, oh, he's just waiting till dad dies. Because when dad dies, he's going to kill us all. And the dad died. Go read it. The dad dies and they go, okay, Joseph, because Joseph's still the head man. He's number two in Egypt. It, it's like, okay, he's going to get us. And Joseph said, guys, do you not understand what the enemy has meant for evil? What you meant for evil, God took it and turned it into good so that I can be where I'm at to save the whole family. Sometimes when you think you're being done wrong, or you got fired, or you got, you know, someone did this or that, and it pushed you in a certain direction. When you love God, all things work out to the good. And that direction may have just pushed you into your destiny that will end up one day turning around and blessing the very people that put you there. Come on, someone in this house. Wow. Whew. What about Ho Hosea and Gomer? God tells Hosea, the prophet, you're going to marry Gomer. I mean, right there. Gomer, Lord? <laughs> but Gomer, God, God told prophets to do some interesting things. He told one prophet, lay on your side for how many months was it? Pastor Joey, six months or three months? Lay on like your left side for three months. If I laid on my left side for three months, I don't think I can use my shoulder anymore. I wouldn't be able to sleep. It says sleep on your left side. I mean, Lord, I can't sleep. I, I go right, left. Who's a, a flipper? I'm a sleep flipper. I just stay on your left side. I'd be like, I said, Lord, you got to tie me on my left side and stay on my left side. One prophet, he said, I want you to preach naked. Jesus, can you picture that? <laughs> One of them, he says, I want you to cook your food with human dung. Human dung. I mean, I, I, I've eaten a lot of things. But cook your food on human dung? The prophet was like, oh, come on, God. Human dung, please. You know that's illegal. I, I like the way they bargain with God, start talking to God. You know that's wrong in the law, and I, I can't eat with this human dung because that's wrong, so please. And it, God goes, all right, animal dung. <laughs> and he had to cook with animal dung. And so, but here, God tells his prophet, listen, do you really want to know God, or do you want to just have this uh, fantasy land about who he is? All right, so he tells, he tells Hosea, he says, go marry Gomer. Well, Gomer got a problem. She's a prostitute. No doubt. She's a prostitute. So he goes, he marries Gomer. They have a kid. Well, then guess what? Gomer gets a, she goes back to the lifestyle. She goes back into prostitution. I can imagine, you know, Hosea coming home and said, well, she's back at it. I'm glad I'm done with that. And the Lord said, oh, you, you thought you you're not done. Go get her again. Uh, I might not be hearing God right. That's the devil. No, go get her again. And you can't just go get her because now she belongs to, I, I don't know another word, a pimp. For real. That's what the Bible said. So she had to, he had to, Jose had to buy her from the guy who owned her now. So he had to buy her back. which represented God and his people. God has married a bunch of prostitutes because we have all cheated on him. 
We have all committed sin with the world. But he still says, I want you. And then you go out and you, you, you give yourself away. And he says, I love you so much, I will buy you back. What do you think Jesus was? He was to purchase, to buy us back. He purchased us to buy us back. Even though the things we've done to him, the things he's seen us do, he says, I don't care. I love you that much. I will buy you back. I don't know about you guys, but that's pretty doggone amazing. Listen, the heart of God is always reconciliation. Look, sometimes it may not happen, but it isn't because he don't want it. And sometimes you'll do your best for it, but the other person won't allow it. Well, same scripture, you go to Romans 12, it says, that's okay. As far as you, you do your best. You can't do nothing about what someone else does, but you can do everything about what you do. You do your best. And then lastly, uh, well, not lastly, I'll get two more. Paul and Mark. Mark disappointed Paul. He was on a trip with him, his first trip. He abandoned them. After that, Paul didn't want anything to do with Mark. Maybe someone's abandoned you along your journey and hurt your feelings. And you, you got to a place you don't want nothing to do with them because they disappointed you. But Paul later on realized that, you know what? People can change. Can I, can I say that? People can change. We say all the time out of our mouths, they'll never change. Why are we saying something that's untrue? People can change. And so Paul looked back, and I'll be honest with you, Paul probably didn't just look back at Mark while he helped Barnabas. He stayed true to the course. And so, but he probably looked back and said, you know what? I was probably a little hard on him. He's very young. Maybe I shouldn't have been as hard on him. Who knows? But the point is, later on, Paul goes, hey, tell Mark. I need him. Some people who have disappointed you in life, later on in life, you're going to need them. We need to be able to reconcile. We need to be able to reconcile. Wow. Abraham and Lot, last one. Abraham and Lot. Man, they... they Got a little tension going on, not between Abraham and Lot so much, but it was between the people connected to Abraham and Lot. Sometimes the people connected to us causes problems with the people connected to them, which causes problems between these two. And so Lot's like, hey, we need to separate. And Abraham's like, man, okay. Whatever direction you take, I'll take the opposite. So Abraham, in the more maturity, was like, I'm not, I want what's best for you. Do we really want what's best for others? And Lot goes, he looks to fertile land, he says, I want that. And Abraham said, no problem. Abraham takes off what did not look fertile. And the Lord speaks to him and said, Abraham, don't worry about it. As far as your eye can see, I've given you everything. What happens later? Lot gets himself in a bind. Lot gets captured. Did Abraham go, yep, that's good for him. Shouldn't have got himself in that position. No, Abraham goes, I got to go get him. I got to go get him. I got to go help him. And so Abraham rescues him. And then they don't stay together. Lot stays there. And then God says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, which was where was Lot was at. Abraham then begs God, please, what if there's 50? righteous people God says well there's 50 I won't do it and Abraham that was too easy what is it 40 oh yeah no problem 30 20 and then finally he's like well what about 10 if there's 10 and he goes if there's 10 Abraham I won't I won't do it there wasn't 10 were they how many came out three four tried to three made it three but God knew Abraham's heart. Abraham was thinking about Lot the whole time when he was asking God that question. Guys, the Spirit of God is about 
reconciliation, forgiveness and reconciliation. I mean, isn't that the whole story of what has brought us together here in this room? Is forgiveness and reconciliation? If we believe in miracles for healing, help, favor, provision, and forgiveness of our sins, but cannot believe or give forgiveness and accept reconciliation with others, then what does that say about our Christianity? It says that it's not different than the world. I don't know about you, but even when my emotions and my feelings don't want it, in my spirit, I want it. I'm going to do something. It's kind of like we're in that movie. The movie just ended. Drop the mic. I think it'd be a shame just to jump up and walk out here. Turn on meditation music. I want you to take, there's a countdown, five-minute countdown. Go ahead, guys. There's a five-minute countdown. I want you to just take a little time to close your eyes and allow the Holy Spirit to do what he's going to do. And whenever you're ready, you can get up and make your way out. After the five minutes, we'll turn the lights on and everything, and you can make your way out. Hope you got something from this, guys. Really do. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Please like this video, comment if there's anything on your heart that you would like to share with the community. And be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you can be alerted every time we upload something new. You be blessed.